Tottenham Hotspur have some very special, talented players. And some of those players are unbelievably young, but yet so good and are only going to get better. They also have players like Richarlison, who have been on fire lately, who've been incredibly underrated and improved so much. But they also do have big problems. No team has conceded more goals than Spurs in the 90th minute. No team has sort of bottled a lead or just conceded a goal so late other than Spurs. They struggled to shut down games. And we saw that versus Everton. They were in control of the second half and then they gave it away. And I was going to do a match reaction to Spurs Everton. And then I thought, now nah, I'm not. Now nah, I'm not. And then I was like, well, there's so much to talk about. I want to talk about the key Van der Ven's performance. I want to talk about um, the performance of Richarlison. I want to talk about how good they were. But I also want to talk about some issues Spurs have that they need to fix. And I thought, you know what? I do this on my Man United channel. It's a bit more tactical. But we're going to talk about five things we learned from Spurs to Everton too. And I want to start by talking about Mickey van der Ven. I want to start by talking about positive, a player that has been phenomenal. I remember when Spurs signed Mickey van der Ven and I just saw clips of him running and I was like, this guy is quick. He's also injured his hamstring. So doing those sprints for him must be a little bit difficult as well, coming back from an injury. But Mickey van der Ven for is an absolute joke for 22 years of age. He's absolutely unbelievable. Probably, arguably, best centre-back under age 23 in the world. I think Saliba is 23 now, but he's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And what makes him so special is his ground coverage, his ability to defend wide spaces. I'm going to show you some clips in a second. His ground coverage, his recovery pace. Everton were trying to play balls in behind because Spurs commit, Spurs like to attack. Ange Postecoglou, a very attacking-minded coach, which I think is why I really do enjoy watching Spurs. They're such a good team to watch. And as a neutral, I don't have to worry about anything, whereas I can see why Spurs fans panic a bit because sometimes they overcommit. But Mickey, it doesn't matter because Mickey van der Ven's there. You know, Everton were trying to transition. Everton were trying to transition a lot. And Mickey van der Ven was there with his recovery pace. His ability to cover so much ground, his ability to read the game, his ability to put in last-ditch tackles, as well as being a good jeweler, as well as being good in possession, as well as being comfortable on the ball, makes him an all-round unbelievable centre-back. He's just come back from injury. And yet again, he was a cut above nearly everyone on that pitch, Barbara Charleston today absolutely phenomenal because he can break lines he can progress the ball he's comfortable in possession which is what you need in a top center back he has the athleticism he's physically good he wins his jewels he's got the long legs to get his feet in and win those tackles he's got the pace he's got the mobility he's got the athleticism ability and left him kind of linked he's got all the physical elements you need pace being a good jeweler physicality winning jewels but also the iq can read the game can cut out passes can say you know what i'll, I'll let you get ahead of me because i'll just catch you but also the ability athletically to cover spaces. He's so good and he's so good at defending the wide spaces that he could almost operate as a left back if they needed him to. Obviously, that's not going to happen. But what if every elite team needs is someone that's good at ground coverage, someone that's good at defending wide spaces, big spaces, large spaces, so the team can commit and go forward and there's someone that's an elite jeweler. And to be fair, Van der Den can do a little bit of both. Uh, but he can break the lines of his pass. He can progress the ball. But it's his IQ, his reading of his game and his recovery pace was insane. Three out of three tackles won, one last man tackle, six clearances, six duels won, 53 out of 58 passes completed, 91% pass accuracy, 74 touches. This guy is only 22. He's only going to get better. It's an absolute joke how good he is. And I'm saying this as a Manchester United fan. Van der Ven is unbelievable. I'm going to show you this. This is the moment. And I can't show you the footage footage. But Mickey van der Ben, he's through on goal. Harrison is through on goal and Mickey van der Ben is there. You're thinking Harrison is through on goal. Oh, my days. And then Mickey van der Ben swoops in and tackles him. But he does that a lot. He does that a lot. And he's come back from a hamstring injury, but he's doing those sprints. He's doing those last ditch tackles. And that's why I think Spurs, are one of the reasons Spurs are so comfortable getting forward is because they're like, oh, Mickey van der Ben will sort that out. Very risky way Spurs play when they're 2-1 up, but then they've got Mickey van der Ben. So I thought I wanted to talk about him first of all. I do want to talk about Charleston, but we have to talk about Spurs. And I think the problem with Spurs is they lost control of the game. And this is something they've done before. I think Spurs are a very good side. But the last 10 minutes of their last game was a bit nervy versus uh, Brentford. They, they're they very, very good. And they go ahead and they deserve to go ahead a lot of the time. But then sometimes they look almost vulnerable to just dropping points in the final 10 minutes. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a mental thing. I don't know if it's Ange Postecoglou substitutions. I don't know if it's the fact that Ange just doesn't like them to just put it in the corner and defend, defend. He loves to still play his football, no matter what the score is. But Spurs didn't have a good first half. 
lucky to go 2-1 up. Two moments of Richarlison brilliance. Second half, Spurs played really well. There was moments where I thought Spurs were going to make it 3-1, but maybe decision-making and silly mistakes cost them a little bit there. But for the most part, the second half was a very, very good, confident, dominant performance from Spurs. Madison was showing his, his skill. Werner was making some really good runs. And then maybe it was the substitutions. I get bringing in Radu Dragerson in. I think that was a very smart substitution. Saar coming in. He's so important for them. I get that. Um... But it's almost like maybe taking Hoiberg off, they lost that physicality. And I think the Everton game is such a physical game um, that maybe all in all, not all the substitutions needed to be made. Was Brian, did Brian Gill really need to come on? But I looked at Spurs and I said they had that game, but they managed to lose control in the final 10 minutes and it turned into Brexit ball. And that is exactly what Everton will want. Everton want a game where it's fast, it's in the air, is physical, it's Brexit ball. And Spurs ended up playing into Everton's hands there. Everton got Brexit ball. Everton got fast ball. I don't know if it was the substitutions that did it, but they just lost control. And then instead of putting it in the corner flag, they gave the ball away, gave away a silly foul. You can't give a silly foul away against Everton when Spurs aren't the best at set-piece defending and Everton are one of the best teams in the league at set-piece defending. And it was like Spurs walked into that. Everton, 12.30 kickoff away from home. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a physical game. They're, they're going to give you a game. But they played into their hands right at the end. And I think that's something that Spurs need to work on. Going into the third thing we learned, Richarlison. I did a video the other day. Well, I spoke about it in my video the other day. I said Richarlison is actually becoming incredibly underrated because this time a year ago, we were saying who's the worst signing of the season, Richarlison or Anthony? I mean, there's there's no comparison between Richarlison and Anthony. Now, Richarlison's the only Brazilian player to get 10 plus goals this season or something like that as well, or, or 10 plus goals and that something or something. He's been absolutely unbelievable. He's got nine goals in his last eight Premier League games, two versus Newcastle, one versus Forest, one versus Everton. Um, didn't score versus Brighton, but goal versus Bournemouth, goal versus Man United, goal versus Brentford, goal versus Everton. He's really stepped up in Son's absence. He really has. Maybe going into the central area has helped him. Maybe now sort of being that main man in the central area suits him a little bit more. But I'm not really here to completely talk about Richarlison's goals. I want to talk about his work rate. I want to talk about his movement, his ability to score with the least touches per striker. Um, and his ability to make the most out of the ball, because I actually think there's times where Richarlison's starved, but he makes the most out of it. And I think I've been talking about this with Rasmus Hoyland and Man United. I think Rasmus Hoyland is an incredible striker and he got a bit of stick for not scoring goals. But I thought, you know, he makes the most out of his opportunities with the ball when he, and he presses well, when he works hard and he links up well, when he does so much more than score goals. And Richarlison's like that. Richarlison got a lot of stick. But when you look at it, he works hard. He doesn't actually get crazy amounts of service compared to like Haaland and Nunes. And he makes the most of it. And today, 46 touches. But I want to talk about his three jewels one, his three recoveries, his two key passes, three shots, two goals, two brilliant goals, two great finishes. But recovering the ball, winning his jewels, linking up play. Richarlison does a lot. And I saw John McKenzie do this good sort of Fred on Richarlison. And it is touches per shot for players. Touches per shot for Premier League players. You can see Rasmus Hoyland's in there. But look at that, 1.37. He basically takes most he takes most of his shots first time or has a touch than shots very rarely has two touches and a shot he doesn't get much time on the ball but he's very good at having the ball in a tight space taking the touch or taking it first time and actually finishing composure was very good two two very good goals today great one touch finishes finishing and he's a very good ball striker I think his composure has definitely gone up levels and he's sort of becoming a lot more clinical I think he has a good connection with a doggy and a good and they use that sort of left half space very very well when the doggy was doing those cutbacks and I think Richardson does sort of drift to the left um and I, but I thought one thing that sticks out about Richardson for me is how hard he works for the team. I think Richardson works incredibly hard for the team. I think his defensive work rate is class. He's coming back, he's winning duels. Yes, he gave away some silly fouls that gave the ball away stupidly. But He's very, he's all round work rate, his all round play really helps Spurs. And I think Ange Postacoglu plays such a high intensity style of football that Richarlison's all round work rate is massively helping them. Other things I just picked out is that he makes really good runs, he makes really good movement. He makes movement where he'll draw a defender away with him, and that might open up a space for Madison to play it into Brennan Johnson. He very cleverly does things that doesn't really get picked out. But I think one thing that, you know, two key passes today is he links up well. And I think something he's established this season is confidence. He looks to be in a better space, but also he's really established a good relationship with his teammates. The link-up play has been good. The runs have been good. The reading of the game, you can see the patterns of play. And, you know, while Spurs have dropped points here and there, one of the reasons people have been praising Spurs so much is it's so clear what Spurs are going to do. It's so clear that they play with patterns of play and stuff. Whereas as a United fan, everyone's like, well, what is Eric Tenol doing? Where are the patterns of play with Spurs? You can see it. Uh, but I, I wanted to pick up one more thing about Richardson before I get to the next point, because this video is getting too long for my liking was also his very, very good box presence. 
very good block press presence, can win headers, he can sort of time head as well, can run into the box well, and, and that's sort of shown with his touches per shot as well. Fourth thing we learned is set pieces slash Vicario is a weakness. Now, Vicario has been an unbelievable goalkeeper, best goalkeeper in the league this season, best shot stopper in the league, best shot stopper in the league, Vicario. But his weakness is set pieces being pushed and teams are exploiting that. Everton exploited that today. This has happened once or twice before to Vicario. Yes, I think goalkeepers need more protection from set pieces. And I think the Man City goal should have been ruled out. My teams are really pushing and leaning on that Vicario weakness from set pieces. And Spurs have conceded from set piece yet again, where you do say, could Vicario have done better there? Spurs conceded from set pieces again today. They didn't win their set pieces. That is a weakness. Yes, they're coming up against Everton, who are the best set piece side basically in the league. But you could argue, should have Ange have kept players like Koyberg on that were more physical? Did Brian Gill need to come on? Could that have helped? But then you also look at uh, Spurs and you say, why are you giving away set pieces? Put it in the corner flag. Because they've conceded eight goals in the 90th minute and a lot of them have come from set pieces. And that is something they need to work on. That's something Vicario needs to work on from corners. He's going to be seen as a weakness. But Spurs need to work on keep the ball better in the final 10 minutes. But all in all, I want to end and say I still think, despite Spurs dropping points in those final minutes, they're in a good place. Everton away is never easy. I think Spurs haven't won there for five seasons. So all in all, I don't think a point at Goodison is a bad result at all. Yes, I think you had an opportunity to go equal with Arsenal, opportunity to seal yourself in the top four. Top five should get you Champions League, though. So I can understand the frustration, especially because when Spurs sort of came out in the second half, they started the second half well. So even though I don't think they did enough to really deserve to be 2-1 two up, two one up in the first half, I was like, Richarlison just had that moment of brilliance. I thought in the second half, they, they looked like they were going to make it 3-1 and then they threw it away in those last sort of 10 minutes again. Uh, but all in all, I don't think it's a bad result. Uh, Goodison Park's a very difficult game. Everton are actually very, very tough team to beat. They've caused a lot of big side problems. 12.30 kickoffs always just difficult in general, especially when they played two days ago. But look, 44 points. Yes, defensively, they need to improve. Yes, there will be things, but Angie's going to learn and grow. They're going to only get better. Sonny's going to come back. Suma's going to come back. Um, you know, Saar's going to get moulded in. They're going to get all their key players back. I think, I think Spurs will be fine. I think Spurs will be fine. I think they're in a good place. Anyway, let me know if you like this video. Smash your like, smash your subscribe. Thank you for watching. Bye.